Okay, so this is our Simon Don reading group, uh, continuing with uh, Individuation Volume 2 on history of the notion of the individual. Um, so last time we, uh, we went through a few different sections. Um, there were, I think, um, a few shorter sections. Um, so we looked at, uh, I won't go through all of them, but maybe, um, yeah, so with Hume, um, there, there was this um, sort of uh, disjunction, I guess, between two different approaches to the individual or two different um, uh, ways of thinking of the individual in Hume. So on the one hand, um, Hume denies that there is such a thing as a, a substantial self. Um, so in our, our experience, we only ever have um, uh, impressions and ideas and we never have either an impression or an idea of the self as um, something that would uh, sort of underlie the impressions and ideas themselves. We Anything that we can um, experience is always going to be an impression or an idea, and therefore it can't be the, uh, the self that underlies our impressions and ideas. Uh, so we never have an experience of the self and so Hume takes it that we, we can't, since, since, since impressions and ideas are uh, sort of exhaustive of our experience, we can't um, have, uh, the self can't be an object of experience. And so we, we can't have any uh, concept or understanding of the self. Uh, so that's sort of the one side, this denial of the existence or um, present in experience of the self. Uh, but then the other side is that in, in Hume's uh, sort of more practical work, like in his historical and economic work, he uh, treats the individual as, uh, as primary. Uh, so social formations are made up of in individuals that are given prior to the, the social organization. Uh, and so it's a, it's a kind of um, atomism in the sense that it starts from these um, uh, self-contained individuals and then builds up the social structure from there. Uh, so there's a... Um, this kind of duality between um, the theoretical philosophy that that denies the existence of uh, an individual, or at least deny, denies our capacity to have any knowledge of the individual as such, uh, and then the practical um, writings on history and uh, economics and other topics where he takes the individual to be primary, uh, and so there's no um, there's no sort of uh, attempt to reconcile these two um, these two uh, op op uh, opposite um, characterizations of the individual in Hume. Uh, and so this is just sort of, um, I guess, a, a recognition of the problem, um, which is more sort of characteristic of Hume's philosophy. He, he often uh, just sort of presents problems uh, and says there's no way of solving them in theoretical philosophy, but in practice, it's not... Um, we, we don't need to sort of worry about these problems. Um, and then we looked at, uh, skipping ahead a little bit, we, we looked at what Simon Don calls the philosophy of nature. Um, and um, so this, uh, it's not 100% clear who exactly he has in mind when he's talking about philosophy of nature, because as I mentioned uh, last time, normally when we talk about philosophy of nature, we're talking about um, Schelling, and uh, people who were connected to him in the late 18th to early 19th century. Um, but that's not what Simon Don was talking about here. He's, he's still thinking of the sort of mid 18th century. Um, but then he, yeah, so he talks about the, the sort of um, uh, initiatory aspect of, um, uh, of philosophy, which uh, presents philosophy as a, a kind of um, uh, incorporation into nature or this unity with nature that you have to be initiated into uh, in the same way that you would be initiated into a religious um, organization. Uh, and then uh, he also points to this, in the importance of symbolism in this philosophy, um, that symbols are, or, or signs are um, uh, sort of um, tools that the individual can use to recognize the, the complementary side uh, of of the the environment or of nature um, that that join together with the individual to form a, a unity. Uh, so this this sort of theme of the lost unity of the individual um, that the individual has to sort of recover the original unity with nature is a is a 
a recurring theme. And then he sort of skips ahead in a strange way to um, some 19th century French uh, writers, the French romantics like Gérard, Gérard de, no de Nerval. Um, and um, these writers uh, are um, sort of following the same theme um, uh, of you know, the sign, um, recovery of lost unity, um, uh, so Nerval has this um, uh, sort of series of images of um, the actress who is a repetition of the mother and, and so on. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's uh, kind of a strange historical sequence that, Sim that Simondon uses here because these writers are um, in the mid to late 19th century um, in France, but he's connecting it to um, uh, 18th century writer, uh, philosophical writers. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, a bit of a, a bit of an obscure point in this um, historical development here. Um, oh yeah, and Angus has a question about uh, the reference to um, German initiatory philosophy. So it's on page 617 of the, of the PDF. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm not 100% sure who he has in mind, but it could be someone like Jakob Böhme, um, who was a um, 16th, uh, I think 16th century mystic um, writer in in Germany, who, who was actually um, a shoemaker by trade, but he had these uh, mystical experiences that he wrote uh, wrote down and uh, published, um, you know, like a, a huge amount. I think like 15 or 20 volumes uh, in his collected works. Um, um, and, uh, yeah, he was, he was very popular and, uh, had an influence on the, uh, German idealist. Yeah. Hegel, um, the Böhme was, um, one of the important reference points. Uh, and, um, yeah, I think he, he thought of his own, Hegel thought of his own work as in some ways, um, uh, sort of making explicit what was only implicit in Böhme's work, um, so that like Burma is using sort of mystical imagery and so on. And then Hegel is translating that into a uh, clear, or at least to him, clear um, rational concepts. But that's, that's just a guess on my part. Um, it's not, it's not obvious um, that uh, like who exactly this German initiatory philosophy that Simondo mentions is supposed to be. And, um, and that also, um, leads me to suspect that when he's talking about uh, philosophy of nature here, when he uses this term philosophy of nature, he might be thinking also of Herda, um, who uh, I'm not sure what his relationship to Böhme was, but um, uh, Herda has a, a text called, um, I believe, uh, Ideas Towards the Philosophy of Man, uh, which is a kind of um, philosophical cosmology, or starts with this philosophical cosmology on the formation of the earth and uh, the origin of human beings, and, and then sort of descends into um, an account of the, the anthropology, of a philosophical anthropology, so an account of uh, what human beings are. Uh, and so his work is also um, more generally taken to be one of the first um, uh, sort of uses of history in, in a philosophical context. Uh, so Herda takes history to be um, an essential component to uh, the understanding of what the human being is, as opposed to just sort of a contingent set of events that happen to human beings. Okay, so we're, um, we, we ended last time on page 618, uh, and so we'll pick up on at the heading Naturalism and Materialism, uh, if someone else would like to read from there. Uh, yeah, I can read. Naturalism, Materialism. For Diderot, the idea of nature is accompanied by the refusal to specify the limits of particular beings. Individuals do not have rigid limits assigned to them. Quote, there is nothing precise in nature. Nothing is the essence of a particular being. And you speak of essence, poor philosophers. Unquote. Nature is a whole into which particular beings dissolve. D'Alembert's dream expresses a naturalism wherein Borgia, a vitalist doctor, exposits the thesis of the animal, an aggregate of animalcules which, by joining together with one another, become organs for the whole. In the individual, there is no other unity than this unity of aggregation, which incessantly varies, transforms, without there being a veritable death, and without reaching the whole. There is a general flux that must change the species completely from one planet to another, and from one era to another. The transitory, transitory identity of the self only exists through this whole. 
quote, change the whole, you necessarily change me, unquote. There is in each being an image of all the others. Quote, every animal is more or less man. Every mineral is more or less plant. Every plant is more or less animal, unquote. This naturalism blurs the limits of the individual and brings him closer to nature. Instead of being an unchangeable term, the individual appears to be fashioned by nature. Quote, the organs produce needs and needs produce the organs, unquote. Morality is transformed by this naturalism. The individual's return to nature is this return to the instinct described in uh, Supplement to the Voyage of Bougainville. Already in the work of a humanist philosopher, we can get a sense of the early sketches toward a philosophy of nature that connects the individual back to something other than humanity and makes him a being relative to the evolution of the world and to human realities. Thus, even though a materialism is not even though materialism is not a philosophy of nature, properly speaking, it implies a conception of the relation between uh, the individuals of the human or animal species in nature. There is a type of unity among all observable, physical, vital, moral, social, human, or animal phenomena. And this type of unity is founded by a common rapport to nature. Um, this intuition of a profound kinship of phenomena is the seed of a conception that is not humanist even though its starting point is found in certain humanists like Diderot, Lametri, Dolbach, and Helvetius. Um, I don't know if we should stop and discuss that, uh, or yeah, if we yeah, should... Yeah, yeah, we okay. um, yeah this, this is interesting. It seems like it's almost like a Spinozism, but there's a historical aspect to substance, so that it's kind of... Const there's Well, I guess Spinoza has a dynamic conception of substance as well. But as substance, as this whole changes, then all of the kind of quasi-individuals that um, make it up also change, it seems. Yeah, um, I, I don't know Diderot's work that well, um, but um, he has a sort of vitalist materialism, which is a, sort of an interesting um, combination that... Uh, um, you know, doesn't really recur, I guess, probably until the 20th century. And, you know, Deleuze, of course, is a, a kind of vitalist materialist. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, so he has this conception of um, matter as uh, not just this sort of inert, um, passive uh, substance that is sort of, uh, uh, that has forces uh, imposed on it or exerted upon it, um, but matter has within it as part of its um, capacity or um, you know, as as um, part of the what what it is to be matter, it has the property of uh, bringing about living beings, uh, and so um, yeah, so the living beings or, or life is is a sort of um, consequence of the nature of matter in in general, as opposed to being something kind of mysteriously implanted into matter from without, uh, and so um, and this is um, this is opposed to uh i guess the more prevalent form of materialism that is uh proposed around this time which is a mechanistic materialism so it's an account according to which uh, matter is in fact just uh some kind of inert substance and uh that uh is that operates in accordance with uh these simple mechanical laws of of impact and so on and uh, all the complex phenomena that we see in the world are just uh, composites of um, atoms or uh, particles of some kind that uh, that are related to each other or connected to each other through these um, mechanical laws. And and so um, this vitalist materialism is um, a kind of uh, denial of the mechanistic nature of uh, the connection uh, between parts of nature. And so. Uh, it uh, at least in Zidro, it leads to this uh, kind of holism as well. So nature is is not just um, this sort of assemblage of uh, of particles. It's uh, this this whole that has uh, a certain um, unity to it that uh, goes beyond just the collection of all the different particles that make it up. Uh, so yeah, it's a it's a very interesting. Um, um, approach to the natural world and it um it also i would say it takes more uh into consideration some of the scientific developments of uh of the time 
in you know chemistry and um, natural history and so on. It uh, it whereas the mechanistic materialism is a sort of um, promise that eventually science will be able to analyze all these phenomena into mechanistic terms. The vitalist materialism is a is a kind of insistence on the um, irreducibility of these phenomena that were not explained in mechanistic terms at that time. This is interesting to me in light of some of the, uh, you know, in the sections on the like high medieval period and the movement away from an Aristotelian conception of causality and kind of the replacement of the various Aristotelian causes with only efficient cause in a sense that Aristotle probably wouldn't have recognized. It seems like every once in a while these other, um, you know, ways of thinking of causality or self-organization kind of erupt into the uh, purely mechanistic picture of the world that um, was a result of some of these high uh, medieval developments or movements away from Aristotle, I guess. Yeah, it's, um, uh, I'm not sure exactly, um, like I said, I don't, I don't know Diderot that well, but I'm, I'm not sure to what extent he would have um, attributed the vital capacities of matter to a final cause. Um, I, I think my sort of my impression is that he would have um, um, not used that language or um, would it, wouldn't have uh, sort of considered life to be governed by final causes. Um, um, so yeah, I think the, the term self-organization that you mentioned, I think is a, a, an important one here because the um, we can sort of distinguish between a diff- an account of uh, a more Aristotelian account in terms of final causes that um, that sort of understands the universe as being directed towards a particular goal and and different parts of the universe are directed to their own goals in the way that um, heavy substances tend towards the center of the universe, namely the earth, and light substances tend towards the periphery of the universe um, in the Aristotelian physics, uh, and then living beings in particular um, have their own finality. So the the acorn has the oak tree as its uh, as its goal of its development, and so on. Um, whereas I think in this kind of vitalist materialism, the idea is not to understand the development or the the changes that living beings and and other forms of matter undergo as as a kind of um, direction towards a goal, but instead it's a kind of um, um, manifestation of uh, hidden powers in in these in matter. Um, so matter has all these sort of capacities within it um, that, uh, in particular circumstances, can be manifested in the form of uh, chemical interactions or um, or life or these other phenomena that are um, sort of non mechanistic. And and so I think that's um, sort of the the understanding that Diderot is is presenting is this idea of matter um, sort of interacting with itself and producing phenomena like living living beings uh, as a kind of manifestation of its hidden capacities uh, as opposed to any sort of um, goal directedness uh, um, in the more Aristotelian sense but yeah there's there's a um, you know the the role of teleology is a um, an important question in I guess the the metaphysics of science, um, you know, since since the beginning of the uh, I guess Galilean revolution, the the um, evacuation of final causes from uh, as as a sort of fundamental mode of explanation in in physics. Um, and we were talking before we started recording about um, teleology and Kant, uh, and he in the third critique has a um, extended discussion of. Um, the conditions under which we can make judgments of teleology, uh, so attributing a function or an end of some kind to um, a property of a living being, you know, this organ has this function or or something along those lines, uh, and and it's still um, a problem that people are you know interested in today, um, uh, and you know there's been attempts to um, explain teleology in evolutionary terms, so so to say that um, we can describe the function of an organ as um, what it was selected for. Um, so uh, if, um, you know, the, a bird's wing, for example, is an organ for flying, its function is, is to um, permit flying because uh, in the evolutionary history of birds, um, 
if it was the capacity to fly that uh, that selected for the the formation of wings. Um, uh, so that's sort of one attempt to um, explain teleology in non-teleological terms. Uh, but uh, you know whether that's successful or not is a, another question. Uh, and there are you know alternate accounts of teleology as well. And in fact, actually, um, I think we we'll, uh, think we see in some of the later sections here that um, evolutionary accounts, um, and, and I think if I remember correctly, we we talked a bit about Lamarck uh, last time as well. But um, so there there are uh, evolutionary accounts that start to appear in uh, in this era. So um, there are uh, natural natural historians um, who uh, start to give give proposals for how different species of animal, uh, or especially animals, but plants as well, um, how they arise out of one another. Uh, and um, so giving a, a history to the, um, the assemblage of living beings, as opposed to just sort of classifying them into uh, categories, which was the earlier approach to um, nat natural history. And, uh, and, and so uh, Darwin's grandfather, um, um, Erasmus Darwin, uh, he publishes a poem around this time or, or in the, the late uh, 18th century um, called Zoonomia, where he gives an evolutionary account of the um, formation of species. Uh, and uh, yeah, Lamarck, who I mentioned, um, publishes in the late 18th century as well, his evolutionary account. So this um, evolutionary um, sort of historical account of uh, the formation of species is is also associated with this um, vitalist materialism in the sense that uh, these evolutionary accounts of the origin of species uh, are are giving um, are giving an account in which um, living beings uh, have this sort of dynamicity to them. They they um, uh, have the capacity to produce new living beings uh, of of a different kind than than them. Uh, and this sort of internal dynamicity is um, analogous to or identical with the dynamicity of, of matter, um, the property that matter has to bring about living beings in the first place. Uh, so this, th there's a, this sort of association of the vitalist materialism and the evolutionary accounts of, uh, of the formation of species. Okay, uh, I think we can go on to the next section. Uh, if someone would like to read the next two sections, the Dolbach and the Edbecius sections. No volunteers? Okay, I'll, uh, I'll read them then. Okay, Dalbach. A certain return to Ionian physiology becomes apparent with Dalbach. Quote, movement is a manner of being that necessarily follows from the essence of matter, unquote, according to the system of nature or the laws of the moral and physical world. Each being has an inherent movement, a proper movement, which excludes the Cartesian principle of the homogeneity of matter. Quote, each being can act and move only in a particular way. Each being has laws of movement which are proper to it, and constant acts following, following its laws, as long as a stronger cause does not interrupt its action." Unquote. It seems that we again find here the principle of the physics of the Epicureans, who gave each atom a power of movement, and attributed to each being the force to persist until the greater force dissolves it by breaking its cohesion. Matter is therefore profoundly individualized according to the materialists. Matter is not at all this ungraspable and unnameable being that the prime matter of, of scholasticism had presented as the contrary of a form contributing intelligibility with determination. Quiddity is already in matter, which, for the materialists, is endowed with spontaneity and dynamism. This is how, in the confrontation between spiritualism and materialism, we can understand the very great difference in the degrees of dignity given to matter. For the spiritualists, matter is the most ignoble of beings because it is the very contrary of the individual. But for the materialists, matter is not something ignoble. It is individualized and is the productive source of a constructive dynamism. This philosophy of nature is a philosophy of spontaneity and of the individuality of matter. Opposing Leibniz to Descartes, Dolbach cites with the greatest honor the principle of indiscernibles whose formula he borrows from Birfinger. Finality, which is needed to organize a matter from outside without spontaneity, becomes useless in this philosophy of nature. Order in nature is nothing but a rigorously necessary arrangement, arrangement of its parts, founded on the essence of things. The beautiful organization of the seasons is the result of gravitation. The human individual is also a mixture of matter, quote, whose arrangement is called organization and whose essence is to feel, think, and act, unquote. The mind of each individual follows from his physical sensibility, which itself depends on temperament. The individual spontaneity is revealed in the search for pleasure and the fear of pain. And Vesius. 
is in the same way that Ambesius shows in his work on the mind that the diversity of individuals only depends on mental dynamism, which is identical in everyone and which comes from physical sensibility, but which is oriented in various ways because attention takes up this or that object, quote, we become stupid as soon as we stop being passionate, unquote. The individual coincides with its dynamism. There is no essence of particular beings. What constitutes the genius of statesmen is not an individual's particular character, but various circumstances. Inventors are not exceptional individualities since they have precursors. In this sense, the individual is found to be strictly connected to his conditions of denesis. The dynamism with which he is endowed is that of nature. He is the bearer of a force that does not characterize him. The individual is not singular. Education is capable of completely fashioning the individual, of giving him this or that particular passion. Passion is not constituted by an innate character of the individual, an, an indestructible nature. It only has to do with circumstances. Man can almost be a completely artificial being, as Edvacius tries to show in his treatise on man. This materialist philosophy is therefore a philosophy of nature in a sense, even though it leaves a lot of room for artificialism. This philosophy is in fact ambiguous, and another aspect of the philosophy of nature will be the one to replace it by renouncing it. Quote, we did not understand, says Goethe in speaking of the system of nature, how such a book could be dangerous. It seems so dull, so Sumerian, so death-like, that we could hardly bear the sight of it, unquote. So yeah, these two authors are, are also um, materialists of, of a sort of vitalist um, sort. Um, and uh, we, we see here um, in the, the back section the, um, um, the idea that um, um, finality is not necessary to explain the formation of various phenomena like living beings that we see in nature. So rather than having something like a goal or an end uh, sort of imposed on matter um, or, or being something that um, is applied to matter from outside, we instead have this conception of matter as having this internal dynamism that leads to the formation of living beings and all these other phenomena that um, have this teleological appearance. Uh, so um, this is sort of what I was uh, getting at um, earlier about, about this opposition to finality, um, this sort of vitalism, vitalist materialism without finality. And he, uh, Simon Dong here describes both of these authors as, um, as philosophers of nature. Um, and there's actually, there's a, so in the collection um, Sur la Philosophie, so on, on philosophy, uh, that's a collection of um, posthumously published uh, texts from Simon Dong, uh, and some of them are from around the same era. There's one text where uh, Simon Dong um, gives uh, a sort of general account of what a philosophy of nature would look like. So a philosophy that um, takes nature to be the, the fundamental principle. Uh, and um, yeah, so that, that book has not been translated yet. Um, but um, I think he's sort of alluding to that analysis here when he describes these philosophers as uh, philosophers of nature. I don't know why the Samar like Samaria is associated with like the death-like or the desert, but I think Milton says something similar. Maybe it's a biblical reference. Yeah, I, I don't know either. Um, I'm just trying to see if I can find something quickly here. Um, I guess the idea was, so the, the term Sumerian refers to, um, um, it's sort of a big reference to Central Asia, I think, in, uh, when it's used by classical authors. Um, um, so, yeah, there, the idea, I think, is that it's, um, um, there's a kind of, uh, like, wasteland or um, empty land, just sort of wandering, uh, wandering people um, uh, across this land. And so the Sumerian territory is um, this kind of lifeless domain, um, as opposed to, um, like, the Mediterranean area where people have... Um, you know, cultivation and uh, cities and so on. I think that's the idea here. That makes sense. I can read the next section. Uh, sure, yeah. So I think it's another short-ish one. Uh, actually, no, it's, it's a couple of pages. So yeah, let, let's read the full um, section on Buffon and Robinet. Okay. Buffon and Robinet. This philosophy of nature becomes more precise with the biologists and naturalists. Buffon and uh, Robinet think... There is no, I think there is no matter that is not alive, i.e. capable of nutrition, reproduction, and growth. This idea existed in Diderot, who took it from the alchemists of the Renaissance, who were anti-mechanists. 
Individuality coincides with the simplest forms of being. Nature solves a problem that consists in realizing the three functions of matter with the most perfection possible. The individual is what realizes these three functions, but it can do so with more or less perfection. Uh, in this search that is the production of species, nature has followed, according to Buffon, a single and continuous line of species in which each more closely resembles its neighbors than all those species which are further removed, in accordance with the Leibnizian axiom of the quote-unquote plenum of forms. Quote, it must be supposed that everything that can be is, unquote. Beneath the different species, there is the unity of a living type that in all possible variations manifests through the continuity of species, which is nothing but the unity of the natural plan. Thus, there exists a sort of archetype of living individuality anterior to varieties into species, which is the solution of the great problem of nature. The individual comes to resolve a problem of incompatibility and perfection and the mutual relation of the three functions of nature. Citing the works of uh, Daubenton, inserted in the fourth volume of the works of Buffon, Diderot raises the idea of a a quote-unquote prototype of all beings, the metamorphoses of which are the living species. The notion of a series which is perpetually present in Buffon gives the panoply of living beings an aspect that makes the individual into both the model of nature and that which is connected to the universe in an intimate way. The continuity of species indicates the unity of a natural plan. The actual state of the living world has its reason and certain rapport inherent in this very state. It is the order of simultaneity that prevails over the order of succession. In this sense, the individual's relation to the species does not indicate any interiority of the species relative to the individual. On the contrary, when the thesis of evolution will become established, replacing the fixest thesis of series, the species will appear to be more significant than the individuals. The individual will be at the service of the species. This is why it is important to note that the philosophy of nature that emerges from the works of naturalists like Buffon and Robinet makes the individual into a term that is on the same level as the species and is neither anterior nor posterior with respect to it. This is the conviction that Marx uh, Robinet's work entitled Consideration philosophique de la création naturelle des formes de l'être ou les essais de la nature qui apprend à faire l'homme. Philosophical considerations of the natural gradation of forms of being or the attempts of nature that learns to make man. The human individual is the most elegant and complicated solution of the problem that nature has given itself. Individualization is progressive from mineral up to man. In the mineral, it is very imperfect since the activity is completely subservient to matter, such that all of the operations are related to the material subject. In the animal, uh, progress is marked by the advent of spontaneous activity, albeit still linked to the material mass. Finally, in man, matter is nothing more than the organ of activity. Higher still, it could be that the that activity completely dematerializes and becomes pure intelligence. The individual, the living individual, is therefore the term starting from which, through a movement on this side of and beyond, we can know the full extent and variety of the real. The living individual is thus the model of reality for the structure of thought. The structure of nature is either the simplest, that of a series or of chain, or more precisely and more profoundly, that of a ramified tree replacing the overly simplistic schema of the chain. According to Charbonnet, quote, the scale of nature might not be simple and thrust out to one side and the other, uh, to one side and the other, the main branches which would themselves push out subordinate branches, unquote. This conception is also that of the naturalist palace for whom the linear series becomes a ramified tree. Lastly, Buffon further perfects the schema of ramification by making it universal and homogeneous. Quote, nature does not take a single step that is not in all directions, unquote. Starting with a given type, nature projects, projects out species that are connected to all other types of species. There exist relations of analogy and a plurality of directions. Quadruped, quadruped includes species similar to birds, the bat, and others that are similar to reptiles, the anteater. The network makes possible the realization of all possible types on each level, to the extent that this level includes it. The natural topology of the network unites at the same time the two opposite image, 
images of the chain in the network. The chain indicates filiation based on a single type, on an archetype that surpasses in dignity and perfection everything that will come after it. The subsequent individuals are an imitation of the archetype. Topology of the tree, on the contrary, supposes that there is a search for an ever higher term carried by that which is already realized but destined to surpass it. Individuals are approximations of a type not yet created. Buffon supposes that these two movements of conversion and procession can coincide and that the veritable topology of nature is that of a network wherein the motifs repeat indefinitely in all directions, such that the chosen individual is always completed in itself, a source for others and the result of others. In the highest sense of the term, it is a symbol of others. The universe has the structure of a crystal, of which the individual is the lattice. These theoretical studies and constructions were supported by Charles, Charles Bonnet's discussion, or sorry, discovery of beings with a homogeneous structure like the polyp. The ascending series of beings can no longer be envisioned as a passage from the confused to the distinct in the way Leibniz envisioned it. The intrinsic character of a continuous progression of distinction in the series is no longer sufficient. What must be considered is the structure of an individual term of the series, and it is only with respect to this structure that others can be classified. The highest term is one that allows us to classify all the others based on this relation of analogy that goes from term to term. Consequently, one term of the series doesn't merely have a function insofar as it's placed on a certain rank. It also has a series, a sense or direction in accordance with its own structure. To use a mathematical image, it can be said that the cardinal character of the term determines its ordinal character. Due to analogical relation, the individual has a consistency and a constitutive value that it didn't have with Leibniz. There is reversibility between the proper nature of each being and the manner in which the place it occupies in the ensemble determines its nature. The structure of the network as a topological scheme of nature, as a topological scheme of nature, it supposes that there is a complete reversibility between the singular individual being and the ensemble. Uh, we haven't seen, I guess, the terms conversion and procession for a while, but it seems like the idea here is that there is both a continuity and a discontinuity. Um, the continuity being this this continuity of of species, so that it must be supposed that everything that can be is, um, and the discontinuity being the relation of all these species to the uh, this ideal archetype. Yeah, I think um, we have this schema here. What what Simon Don calls this crystalline schema, or um, uh, this depiction of the, the world or of nature as um, both an individual um, uh, uh, an individual that contains all the various entities that make up nature uh, and then also made up of individuals and so each portion of of nature sort of reproduces the structure of nature as a whole um, so that uh, our, our sort of model for understanding nature is the individual living being uh, and so we have this um, um, as you said, continuity in the sense that each um, each living being or each uh, entity is connected to all these other entities um, in in these um, sort of ramifying uh, tree tree structures that make up this network. Um, and then we also have um, I'm not sure if discontinuity is exactly the right word, but there's um, a kind of separation between the uh, the nature of a of an individual and then the nature of a species that um, that contains the individuals uh, and the species has uh, has priority over the individual in the sense that um, the individuals are transitory um, they're born and they die and um, you know there's the sort of famous conception of of nature as um, um, how would I, how to translate it um, sort of prodigious in the individuals, but sparing in species. Um, so you can think of, um, you know, various insects where they, they lay like hundreds or thousands of eggs uh, and only a few of them survive to the next year to reproduce. But um, the, the many individuals are, are sort of um, means towards the end for perpetuating the species. Uh, that's sort of the conception that is, uh, that's used here. Um, uh, yeah. And so there, there's, this this sort of network structure is something that um, I think Simon Don is is um, uh, drawing out from the work of these naturalists. It's not something that they themselves uh, sort of explicitly state. Um, this is his uh, contribution to an analysis of the the history of um, 
uh, of, I guess, proto-biological thought um, because uh, these authors were not um, using the term biology themselves. I wonder if this reference to anteaters is reference to the fact that they have very slow metabolism, like reptiles. Otherwise, I'm not sure what that would be. Yeah, I found that weird as well. Um, um, I'm not sure exactly why anteaters are considered to be similar to reptiles. I wonder if, um, let me just check what the French is. Um, um, where is the bit about the anteater? Uh, right. I think it's at the top, yeah, top of 623 or bottom of 622. Yeah, I guess there are some reptiles that eat ants. Um, that could be the connection. Um, yeah, so it definitely is anteater is the, uh, the French term. So it's, it's not a translation mistake or anything. Um, I was thinking that maybe instead of the anteater, what he was thinking of was the armadillo, like the, the sort of scaly skin that armadillos have. But um, the, the French text definitely says anteater. So I don't know. Um, it could be um, sort of a confusion of, uh, um, you know, uh, anteaters are, are from South America, I think, exclusively or possibly, possibly primarily. I'm not sure. But um, um, I'm not sure how. How, how much familiarity these people would have had with, you know, anteaters and their um, uh, physiology and so on. So it might have been just a, a sort of confusion of um, what exactly they they were like. Um, but yeah, that's a, kind of a strange point. Uh, yeah, there may be African anteaters. Yeah, uh, so I'm not sure. Um, but in either case, uh, it would have been um, sort of a, an exotic animal for people in France to be writing about. Uh, Buffon also is interesting because he, um, I think he's one of the first people who tries to give um, uh, an estimate of the age of the world um, in, in scientific terms. Like, of course, there's the famous um, um, estimate from Bishop Usher that the world is 6,000 years old, which is based on um, uh, some classical histories and um, trying to connect those up with the account in Genesis um, and sort of estimates of the, of the age of these people. Um, and, uh, you know, adding up all these ages and you get to around 6,000 years. Um, um, and um, that, that estimate, I think, was not as um, sort of universally shared as, as maybe it, it, it has sort of the reputation of being. Um, but still, the general idea was that the world was, you know, a few thousand years old. Um, and then Buffon um, comes up with this estimate uh, based on, so his, he follows the... Um, Kant Laplace uh, um, account of the formation of the solar system uh, out of a, a nebula of um, hot matter of some kind, and he tries to give um, he tries to give an estimate of the speed of cooling of this hot matter to reach the the observed temperature of the Earth, and he comes up with a figure I think of about 130,000 years something like that, um, and he says he says you know this might seem you know uh, extraordinary, like extraordinarily long. Um, uh, and so he sort of apologizes for the, 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 uh, appearance that this is an extraordinarily long period. Um, and of course, you know, in, uh, contemporary, um, estimates of the age of the earth, we're talking about like 4.3 billion years old. Um, so, um, yeah, he was off by a few zeros. Um, but, uh, it's still one of the first, I think, attempts to, um, estimate the age of the earth using some sort of scientific principle. Um, and uh, in particular, it's, it's noteworthy because it makes the age of the earth much greater than uh, the uh, era for which we have historical records. Uh, so our, our sort of knowledge of history only extends into a, a very small portion of the, the history of the earth. And so we have to rely on um, um, sort of digging up um, um, remnants of previous eras of the of the earth to uh, to, to try to reconstruct what it, what the world was like in this time period before historical records and then uh, another sort of noteworthy point about Buffon is um, he um, was one of the first people who um, uh, sort of recognized or um, attributed importance to fossils as um, records of previous eras of of the world uh, in the sense that he um, he sees that um, there are uh, fossil skeletons of um, something that resembles an elephant living in 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 Europe or in you know in Russia or all these places where there are no elephants today 
And he takes this as a, a sign that the climate was very different in, in those time periods so that um, elephant-like creatures could survive in, uh, in places where elephants today could not survive. Um, and, and so this is, um, uh, you know, of course, the, the actual um, inference that he gives you know, turns out to be wrong. You know, we know that mammoths lived in uh, very cold climates as well, um, uh, so that, uh, you know, the appearance of this elephant-like creature in, uh, in a, a place that's now cold doesn't mean that that place used to be hot. Um, but it's a, an interesting uh, sort of mode of inference in the sense that it um, takes these fossil records to be signs that the previous eras of the Earth might have been very different from the the form, the climate, and the uh, uh, sort of general conditions of the environment uh, as they are now. Uh, and so this is again something that sort of opens up a whole um, a whole domain of of scientific study that didn't really exist before him. Uh, you know, there was classification of of fossils before Buffon, but the idea of using fossils to understand what the world looked like uh, in periods of uh, where there are no historical records is, uh, is I think, if not uh, sort of unique to him, uh, at least he's one of the first people to um, to start making this kind of inference. Okay, um, so I had suggested we do a, a, a shorter session for today, so maybe we can read one more um, reading. So there's the the short, um, like one paragraph section on Boscovich, and then we have a a bit on the end of the 18th century. So we can read those two if someone else would like to read. Yeah, yeah. Can I, can I read? Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I was a little bit like a slow to button like uh, before. So anyway, uh, let me, Boscovi, did, is that right pronunciation, Boscovi? Uh, I think it's Boscovich with the... A bitch, okay. Yeah. Um, emphatics, uh, an effort to conceive reality in this way appears in Boscovich and in Kant's Monadologia Physica. For Boscovich, physics can be reduced to a single law of dynamics, as the title of his work indicates. Philosophie, philosophie natu, naturalis, theoria, redaca, ad unicum legem pirium in natura exist, existantium. Theory of natural the philosophy derived from the single law of the forces that exist in nature. This reduction is possible because the universe is constituted by an ensemble of points that attract when their mutual distance surpasses a certain limit and repel when the distance is below this limit. The universe is completely constituted by this ensemble of points. Matter is therefore reduced to an ensemble of points and energy is reduced to the forces exerted among these po points. The existence of a limit in which the direction of the force is inverted creates a structure comparable to that of a network. Is it? That's it? Or should I go for... for oh, go? yeah, you can continue to the read the next section, too. Okay. End of 18th century. Toward the end of 18th century, the search for a conception of the individual within a philosophy of nature will be accentuated and deployed in a sense that is less scientific, more effective more mystical, and in general linked to the meditations of German philosophy. The human individual encounters within himself the feeling of a void that is a postulation and an infinitely valuable movement of the soul. Rousseau felt this void and this drive. Quotes, I find in myself an inexplicable void that nothing can fill, a certain reaching out of, a, of the heart towards another sort of enjoyment of which I cannot conceive, but for which I still feel a need. And even that, sir, is enjoyment, for it pierces my being with a vivid poignancy, an appealing sadness with which I would not part. End of course. Thus, the individual feels within it a destiny that carries it beyond the world and surpasses its material and actual limits. Quotes. My heart confined within the boundaries of being, find yourself too constricted. I am suffocating within the universe. I would like to hurl myself into the infinite. End of quotes. In this sense, there are transcendent faculties in this individual that are not necessarily developed in every man. The heart has ideas that are its own, 
according to the expression of Diclo. The Illuminism and esotericism of the end of 18th century arises from this search. Shuvamere enthusiasm is unleashed from the philosophy of enlightenment. The rear is supposed as continuous, constituted by a chain of beings. The existence of the individual is situated in all the rapport that links him to the rest of the universe and to its author. The chain of beings is suffused by universal force. Mesmer explains animal magnetism through the existence of a universal fluid that is always in movement. Therein are revealed the intimate and the sympathetic connections of all beings to each other. The public was hungry for physics experiments in which the instantaneous transmission of a fluid from individual to individual established a tangible schema of communication. The Leyden jar discovered by Bustin Brook spread across the whole continent of Europe because when it was charged by elect- electrostatic machines, it made it possible to give shocks to a chain of people holding hands, with the chain closing through the dialectic of the charged capacitor. It's reported that a congregation of Carthy, uh, Carthy, Carthagian monks conducted this experiment across a length of three kilometers wall. The same experiment was conducted on a commu- company of royal guards in front of the king of Versailles. Today, we are surprised by the fact that the, pro- uh, the pro- propagation of electric charges struck Muschenbrook's contemporaries not by its inst- instantaneous pro- provocation in very thin and very long continuous bodies, but this, like a metal wire, by its ability to pass from one individual to another. Electricity, of, electricity is a bubble what establishes both communication and communion between individuals. Fashion created a cane hiding a capacitor that was charged by means of rabbit skin before offering it. The two people felt the shock at this moment. Many patients became attached to the Massimo bathtub to try to become healed. Lastly, the extreme interest is aroused by the invention of a lightning rod and the controversies that followed are not just due to the utility of this device, but also to the possibility of the capturing the power of thunderstorms, this mysterious force of nature that exudes and transports. If it does not strike fatally, the storm exudes the power and desire of communion. It connects the individual to nature, art itself as it felt, and used this profoundly rational power of the storm. Fragoner? Elsewhere, delicates and cheerful painted in Le Chiffre d'Amour, one of the most passionate paintings of the 18th century. The silhouette of the amorous young girl is cut out by a stormy sky, full of menace and hope, blowing away toward the beyond, awaited and mysterious. That's it, right? Like, yes, yeah, so and we can stop here. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Wow, it's a very interesting kind of like time, right? Like. But it's nice, like, to very, I mean, experiment, full of experiment, experimental uh, people, like, that means, like, the that era was kind of like an era of hope to find something new. Yeah, I think that's far. right. Um, mm-hmm. There was, um, yeah, so the the uh, Leiden jar um, and um, um, galvanism as well um, was another phenomenon that was um, sort of treated as this kind of curiosity um, that was... Um, you know, demonstrated to gentlemen around Europe. Um, so um, um, the Leiden jar produces a um, electric shock, um, and it can be transmitted. So, in, in as uh, Simon no mentions here, there there were these sort of demonstrations where they would have um, a chain of people holding hands, um, and then one of them would touch the the Leiden jar, and then the electric shock would be transmitted along this whole chain of people. Um, you know, more or less instantaneously. Um, or I guess you know at close to the speed of light, which in uh, in at, at the scale of you know 100 people or whatever is is uh, uh, approximately instantaneous. Um, um, and uh, galvanism was this um, effect discovered around the same time where you can um, 
bring about the the movement of um, I think the first um, the first instance of it was a, a frog's leg, so a, a dead frog. Um, you can attach um, you can attach wires to um, these various metals. Uh, you have two different types of metal um, that form this galvanic circuit, and then the uh, the frog's leg starts to move. Um, and so these types of uh, experiments were taken as demonstrations of um, a kind of uh, continuity between uh, um, dead matter and, and living matter, or um, a, a sort of manifestation of the, the hidden uh, capacities of matter for, for life. Uh, so this sort of chemical um, arrangement where you have you know, different layers of, of metals and wires connected to a muscle uh, actually brings about movement in in that muscle in the same way that the muscle might move in uh, a living frog. Um, and uh, yeah, so there was this, these types of phenomena were treated as um, um, not so much, or, you know, in part, they were just treated as, you know, scientific ex experiments that you would perform and collect facts about different substances and so on. But uh, a, another important part of how they were used was, um, as a way of sort of uh, un uniting with nature. Um, there are all these sort of hidden forces of nature that we can um, we can get access to through these kinds of experiments. Uh, and so there's the bit about the thunderstorm as a kind of um, uh, uh, romantic image um, where through the Leiden jar and galvanism, we, we gain access to the power of the thunderstorm, which is this sort of elemental force of nature that um, you know surpasses all human capacities. Uh, but with the Leiden jar, we start to gain access to this force, and um, we get we get some control over it. Uh, and and so there was this sort of unification with nature uh, through these kind of elemental powers, uh, like the thunderstorm, that. Uh, that was like a, a sort of theme of um, a lot of literature of this period. So this is connected with um, what's what's called uh, the Sturm und Drang uh, movement in in Germany. Um, so there's the uh, Goethe's novel, The Sorrows of Young Werther, um, which he later on repudiated, but um, has a uh, it's it's a very romantic novel in the sense that it it has to do with this sort of overwhelming passion and. Uh, um, so there were there were these themes of the this sort of passionate um, unification with nature, with these uh, elemental forces of nature. This this was a sort of uh, common theme in literature at this time. So what's interesting here is that I, maybe like my guess might my, my, might be wrong, but the uh, before that, like I think God was the absolute being, and then like human beings cannot reach reach the God. Um, there was a kind of like a separate line between God and then human being. But in the 18th century and the end of the 18th century, like human beings um, kind of perceived themselves as a kind of individuals with agency and then try to like, how do I say it? Like, even though like just ordinary individual being can be a, can have a p power of nature and then maybe like uh, not the, not to reach like the level of God, but still like we can get some kind of, I mean, human beings can get some power of nature and then we can be, I mean, human being as, in, it, as an individual can be something like, you know, control the nature or whatever. Uh, as far as I'm just saying, it, it sounds like, it sounds like that, like human beings are some kind of self-awareness of becoming something like uh, at this level. What about that idea? Yeah, I think that's right. Um, I think there's there's maybe two different um, uh, sort of historical phenomena that we can distinguish there. Um, where there, so on the one hand, you have the sort of um, mission or or um, the goal of coming to control nature in in various ways. So, um, and this was a, a theme of of uh, the new science as as it called itself at the time, but um, uh, we see it in Bacon and Descartes, um, this idea that science should allow allow us not just to sort of contemplate the natural world, but also to control it um, for for human ends. Uh, and so this is a, a sort of um, uh, traditional theme at, at this point in the in the 18th century. So it, it, that that part is not new. Um, but what I think is new is um, this idea of um, 
not so much controlling nature as uniting with nature. Um, so these phenomena that are sort of beyond human control, like the thunderstorm, um, these these um, what I call these elemental phenomena. So they're, they're these kind of overwhelming natural forces that um, that surpass human uh, uh, control and understanding. Um, now in the 18th century, we start to be able to um, get access to these phenomena in through things like the Leiden jar. Um, and they, they allow us to um, sort of unite ourselves with nature in a way that wasn't possible um, before we started to understand phenomena like electricity uh, through the Leiden jar. Uh, and so uh, I think it's that second part that's, that's new is this idea of um, having a, a union with nature through our experimental um, or, or by means of experimental um, uh, demonstrations like using the Leiden jar. Uh, and and it's so, so it's that, it's that uh, union with nature that is one of the sort of recurring themes of the late 18th century that uh, doesn't appear in earlier writing. Yeah, okay. Thank you. And I think it's in this sense that, um, that Simon Don says that um, Schwermerei, so enthusiasm is the sort of standard translation, but um, Schwermerei had to do with um, this idea of, um, uh, yeah, it, it has to do primarily with religious enthusiasm. So this idea that humans can have some sort of um, super rational access to divine reality or religious truth or something like that. And this was um, one of Kant's main targets in his philosophy of religion was uh, precisely what he called um, and uh, so he wanted to sort of have a, um, uh, you know, in one of his books has the title religion within the bounds of pure reason. Um, and, and so he wanted to sort of delineate the, the sphere in which um, religion can uh, can uh, operate uh, in in relation to reason, uh, as opposed to having some sort of super rational knowledge of religious truths. Um, but uh, for Simon Don, uh, he he argues, or in this text, or he suggests in this text that um sort of arises out of enlightenment, even though the enlightenment philosophers were um, conceived of themselves as being opposed to to um, The this sort of uh, experimental philosophy um, or this approach to understanding nature uh, leads in the 18th century to starting to uh, understand some of these uh, elemental phenomena of nature. And this is what leads to this whole sort of motif of uh, union with nature. Um, and so this it's in this sense that Schwermerei arises out of enlightenment philosophy. So by, by coming to have this sort of rational grasp of nature in uh, Enlightenment philosophy, we end up with this um, um, sort of anti-rationalist um, theme of unification with nature, and and um, how the the sort of how we use the passions um, in connection with some of these experimental phenomena to gain access to these elemental phenomena of nature. Uh, before we finish, I wanted to also go back to the the short section on Boscovich. Um, because, yeah, and, and so it mentions uh, Boscovich and then Kant's monodology. Um, and these are both um, interesting attempts to um, explain, uh, explain matter in dynamical terms. So they, they, um, they want to explain the composition of matter um, as the result of interaction of forces, um, as opposed to the sort of standard Newtonian picture was that um, matter is this sort of um, primitive filling up of space. So there's empty space and then there's um, matter that fills up space. And uh, we can't um, sort of analyze further what it means for matter to fill space. It's just a sort of simple uh, fact about matter. Um, um, and, and there are, uh, in the general sort of corpuscular philosophy that um, surrounds Newton or that Newton is a part of, um, there are atoms that are indivisible, and this again is a sort of simple property of these atoms. Um, whereas what Kant and Boscovich try to do is to um, give an account of impenetrability of matter in terms of forces. So there's an actual physical force that resists um, the penetration of uh, uh, another body into a place where the where there is a body, uh, and and so there are no um, uh, or 
if we if we think of something as an atom, what we are essentially saying is that there is no force that can divide this substance uh, or this body. This body has uh, a force of um, uh, repulsion or of, of impenetrability that prevents any other body from splitting it. Uh, and so they they give this um, uh, picture of uh, the world that's made up of monads that have these attractive and repulsive forces. And this is a sort of um, dynamical atomism as opposed to uh, a mechanical atomism like the Newtonian one. Uh, and so each, each of these monads uh, repels uh, other monads within a certain distance, but it also attracts monads, um, the other monads, um, from beyond a certain distance. And Kant gives an account in which, um, if I remember correctly, the repulsion is a surface force uh, and attraction is a, a volume force or uh, it, it acts um, on on volumes. Uh, and, and so it's because it's because of these two um, different determinations of these forces that they have these sort of intricate relations with each other. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, a, it's a, an attempt to um, give a, a depiction of matter as being composed of forces as opposed to uh, matter being this sort of simple substance uh, on which forces operate. Uh, and so this is a, a theme that Schelling will take up again. We'll see uh, when we get to the Schelling section. And then um, kind of like a, in this ten part, like a similar level of energy, I mean, the monads with a similar level of energy or similar kind of like a tribute to get together and then otherwise like other monads will not be will not get along with the the, the particular monads things like that so some some monads will be um, abolished and then some monads will par uh, perish perish and then i mean that that's the kind of idea like particular monads will uh i mean like a survive um yeah i don't remember the details of the you know, Kantian, Boscovician monodology uh, mm -hmm. that well, but I, I don't think there's um, an account of monads, uh, you know, uh, perishing or surviving. I think the idea is that the monads themselves are uh, sort of are, are eternal. Um, so there's um, a certain determination of uh, a repulsive and attractive forces that make up uh, a particular monad and uh, those monads interact with each other through those repulsive and attractive forces, and um, it's it's this interaction of the monads that makes up the various bodies that we find in uh, like that are composed of many monads. Uh, and those bodies, those composite bodies, can uh, be broken up uh, or dissolved or um, uh, and then reconstituted into new bodies. Uh, but the monads themselves. Uh, don't disappear as far as I remember. Um, uh, so yeah, it's um, it's um, an account of uh, monads that combine to form composite bodies that can uh, that can perish and be reconstituted, but the monads themselves don't perish, as far as I understand. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah. So it's uh, it's definitely an interesting um, sort of alternative picture of physics. Um, that uh, that Kant tries to develop, as, and it's, it's also connected with his um, metaphysical foundations of natural science, which comes later, uh, because in that in that work he again tries to give a um, dynamical uh, construction of matter. He tries to give an account of how matter can arise from the interaction of forces, um, and so yeah, this is a, a theme that he he starts um, developing in the sort of pre-critique period but he continues to work on it in the critical period as well. So it, uh, it sort of bridges those two periods. Okay, uh, so yeah, I, I suggest we stop here for today. Um, we went a little bit longer than I had suggested, but yeah, we can pick up from uh, Recif de la Bretagne next time. I'll have to do some reading because I don't know anything about some of these people. So I'll have to uh, learn a little bit before next time. See you next week.